help us to worship by listening. If you think about it, you know, I get to keep time. It's okay to do that in church, okay? You can tap your foot. You can, you know, snap your fingers a little bit. Just don't walk pews. <laughs> Let me ask you to take your Bibles and turn to the index. Because we're going to go some different places that may not be as easy to find unless you have your index there. You may also want to write down the passages of Scripture, which we always write down the chapter and verse and then the book after that. Uh, I'm going to begin this morning and end at the same place. And yes, what has been on my mind and my heart, probably all of us in differing degrees, is what is happening over in Israel in that particular area. Now, all of us have Fox News, ABC, NBC, CBS News. We, we get all of the things that the uh, government and the uh, pundits will say. So I'm not going to address those things. What I think we should do as God's people is instead look to his word and find out what God would have us to say, to believe, and to embrace during times such as we have taking place. The first verse, and you can just write this one down. Uh, you know it by heart already. You've memorized it. The place where we are going to begin and end, we will not use this particular verse, but the place where we're going to begin is this. God is in control. And so what we do is we pray and we trust God. That comes from Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your pathways straight. Now I would like to turn to Matthew chapter 24 because I think it's appropriate that we hear what our Lord says when it comes to events and the time of day that we are in. Jesus in Matthew chapter 24, beginning in verse 6, says this, And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Now listen closely to the next sentence. See that you are not alarmed. For this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. That's what's happening right now in the Middle East. And there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. Verse 8, all these are but the beginning of birth pains. Now understand something when we read this. We tend to to contextualize these kind of verses to when we live as if it's never been before. But if you will go back through history, those verses have been preached multiple times by pastors when geopolitical issues arise. It happened, I'm sure, in 1948 when Israel was... Uh, and by the way, did y'all know the United States was the first country to recognize Israel as a nation? Uh, also, the Six-Day War, the Yom Kippur War, you know, all the, each time you will have preachers get up and start proclaiming Jesus is about to come back. Well, it could be, but then again, guess what? He might not. So there's a specific thing Jesus tells us here, you know, that these things are going to happen. They're the beginning of birth pains, and what I want us to do now it's something very uh, important, and that is to take a look. We're going to go first to Zechariah. And if you go to the last four books of the Old Testament, you're going to have two of them I'm going to be re referencing here in just a moment. According to my resources, they're everyone's resources, the 600 that have been killed in Israel to this point is proportionately as though 20,000 had been killed in America. There is potential of this 
as described by commentators and pundits, for this to become a regional war. The question we ask is how bad can it be? And the answer is, honestly, we don't know. So what I'm going to do is to take some comments for us in Northwest Alabama. Guys, you realize how protected we are living where we live? We need to praise God and thank God for that. But for a few comments for us who live in Northwest Alabama as Christians, and virtually all that I'll say from this point is going to be scripture with a few comments sprinkled in. In Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 8 is where we'll start. This is what we find written. On that day, the Lord will protect the inhabitants of Jerusalem. This is prophetic. This is one of the Old Testament prophets that is preaching to the people of God. It says the Lord will protect the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Now understand when it says the inhabitants of Jerusalem is talking about them as a people group. Okay? God has protected them as a people group since Abraham. And many have attempted to eradicate them and they will all fail. The Lord will protect the inhabitants of Jerusalem so that the feeblest among them on that day shall be like David, who is the greatest warrior they had, and the house of David shall be like God, like the angel of the Lord going before them. Look at verse 9. And on that day, I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And if you'd like to, look for Zephaniah. We'll be reading there in just a moment. The thing I want us to get here is that the Israeli Jewish people, the Hebrews, are God's people as far as bloodline goes. Now, we Christians are God's people by salvation and sovereignty. But God is still going to use the people of Israel as he carries out his ultimate plan for uh, glorifying his name on the earth. In Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 8, the prophet writes what God is saying. So God is who is speaking here in Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 8. Wait for me, declares the Lord. For the day when, and I, will, I am so glad for that little word there, that means that God has a plan and he is going to be working it out and it will be continued. Wait for me, declares the Lord, for the day when I rise up to seize the prey. And this is so awesome. That, I mean, look at this. For my decision. I, I, we're going to look at a lot. It's going to be a lot of God's sovereignty and providence in what is happening and what has happened and what will happen. He says, for my decision is to gather nations, to assemble kingdoms, get them all together in one place, to pour out upon them my indignation, all my burning anger, for in the fire of my jealousy, all the earth shall be consumed. One of the things that we need to keep in mind, which is glad I have heard this, at least to this point from our politicians, is that the nation of Israel, we will support. What you find here is that those who come against Jerusalem are the enemies of God. I don't care where they are, are located geographically, I don't care what their armament is. I don't. I mean, you can go all the way back to uh, Genesis and Exodus, primarily. That took God. Took, God took a nation, the Hebrews, the Jews, and while they were held captive by the strongest nation in the world at that time, the Egyptians, and He delivered them. Do we not know and think that God can do the same thing today? The answer is, of course, yes, and he will 
do it. He will eventually bring down fire of judgment upon them all. Now, what if? What if we lived in Israel? What if it became a war in the whole area? What if it was spread all the way to the shores of the United States? What if we got, uh, I mean, I'm just, you think of those what ifs, and I want you to, to understand, go to Habakkuk. Habakkuk's over there near the end of the Old Testament. And the passage that we are going to read is written by Habakkuk himself. And to give you the context of what was happening when he was writing this, there was a massive army that was marching to where Habakkuk resided and into the uh, nation that we call Israel today. Now, to try to put it in context, it, it would be like us seeing and hearing hundreds of tanks and airplanes coming our way. For them, it was chariots. For them, it was uh, marching armies. You know, they had a, a way of, of presenting themselves so that the, the ones that they were attacking could hear them coming to instill fear. So Habakkuk is writing in that exact context that there is an army coming, and for all he knows, he is about, listen, back then, it, wars were personal. They didn't shoot a gun from 600 yards or drop a bomb from a mile up in the air. They came in, they had swords, they had spears, and they got personal when it came to attacking when they fought wars. Now, in Habakkuk chapter three, I want us to begin reading in verse 16. Listen to what Habakkuk writes here. I hear, see, there it is. He doesn't even see them necessarily yet, but he says, I hear and my body trembles. Now I've never been to war. I've never been in that type of situation. The puniest thing I can equate it to was when I was playing football and the other team looked bigger than us. It scared me as a little kid. Imagine that times 10,000 when you have a, an army coming in. Let's keep reading. I hear and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters into my bones. My legs tremble beneath me. In other words, he is having a mental collapse a physical collapse, fear is, is got him by the neck, and as far as he knows, he is about to be destroyed. But we keep reading. Yet, I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon the people who invade us. Now, what's he doing? He's taking the situation and the context that he is living in. And he does not even say here, I'm sure that God is going to keep me from dying. What he says is, and, and maybe he does know that he'll get to see it, but the time is going to come, look at it, that he will wait for the day of trouble to come upon those who invade us. He knows that God is overall in control. He's sovereign. He's providential. And the fact that these people, godless individuals, are trying to attack or are attacking, he knows that God is going to bring retribution upon them. Brothers and sisters, that's how we are to live each day. We need to have a set your mind on things above and not things on earth. That's from Colossians. So that when we watch Fox News or hear people talking, our mind, our brain, and our heart needs to immediately go up to God and understand, realize, believe, and embrace His truth because we are talking about more than just temporal matters. We are talking about eternal matters. And after all, what is the worst that anybody can do to us physically? They can kill us. 
They've been doing that over in Israel the last couple of days. What happens if we die? We see Jesus. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. That's what Maranatha means. So we, Paul says, to live is Christ, to die is gain. That is our attitude in the midst of these situations. Can it get worse? Probably. Could it spread? Most likely. Does that change who God is? No. Does that change the truth that he has given us? No. Does that mean that we are to get troubled and upset? Well, look, that's normal. That's human. But that's why our heart gravitates and goes to God's truth. And that's where we sit down and make our camp. That's where we go by the river of Jordan in the, old, in the, in the book of Psalms to plant our tree there. And that's where we will be. Uh, the Lord is my shepherd. What psalm is that? 23rd. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to uh, graze in green pastures. He restores my soul. I mean, we read those kind of things, and that needs to be how we think. If we do not put in the truth of God into our minds and our hearts, we are going to be a people who live in fear, and that is not what we as believers are to be. Verse 17. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, and the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. You know what he's describing right there? Absolute and complete economic collapse. That's what he's talking about. The, we would call it, what's that place in New York? Wall Street. That, 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 would, that would mean an absolute, total, complete depression. Now, I, got, I could go down that way for a while. I talked to a good friend of mine this week, and he helped me understand it. He's another minister, but he... The point is, is that we need to understand that our faith, our trust, and our hope is in God. And no matter what happens economically, let's keep reading. Look at what he says in verse 18. Yet, in other words, let all this happen. Let the army come. Let there be economic collapse. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. Huh. There it is again. I mean, can you imagine? I know you can. I, I can go outside when there's a full moon and praise God. When I see a rainbow, I praise and worship God. When it rains, when it rains, we need some rain. I can worship God. When there is, when I have nothing and, and I look to heaven and I see where my eternal home will be one day. And so he is telling us here that I will rejoice in the Lord. Look at this next one. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. You know what the number one thing is that we need to praise and worship God is about our name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Jesus told the apostles they came back and they said Jesus, Jesus even the demons obey us. He said big stinking deal. That's my paraphrase. He said what you need to rejoice in is that your names are written in the Lamb's book of life. That's where our hope is. That's where our joy is. No matter what else happens or who else says what they do, or whether or not we have a speaker in Congress, or whether or not we have the president we think we need to have, our hope and, and future and glory and peace is in God. That's why we keep going back to the Word. If you don't get in the Word and you don't go here, let me tell you what's going to happen. You're going to wring your hands like a... <laughs> I almost said the way I thought it. Like Granny Turley did when she was at uh, Thanksgiving, she would sit in her rocker and she would twiddle her thumbs. Of course, she was happy because she saw grandkids running all over the place, bouncing off the wall. But it would be just like a person that all they have is just to sit there and worry. We are not a people who worry, nor are we anxious. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. Verse 19. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer. Have you ever seen a deer run? It's a beautiful thing. 
except when they're coming in front of your car. But I mean, the way they run, they, they bound ever. I mean, it's, you know, and he says, that's the way God makes me in my heart. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. And I love what is written right after that to the choir master with stringed instruments. Do you know what he is doing in response to these kind of geopolitical situations and wars? He is seeing it. It scares him, but he says, but wait a minute. This is where my heart is. And what does he end up at the very end doing? Worshiping God. If we do not have a playlist, some of y'all don't know what a playlist is, but if you find somebody young, they'll teach you and tell you. If we don't have a playlist of God songs, we're missing it. That while we're driving, our hearts can be lifted in the midst of whatever situations there are. And that's what Habakkuk is doing here. He says, okay, all these things are true, but let me tell you what is the ultimate truth. He goes through that and then he says, now it's time to worship. Let's take our hymn books and turn to victory in Jesus, in essence. Now a couple of questions that I've asked. Is this the beginning of the last of the last days? By the way, turn to Matthew 24. I'll tell you the verse in just a minute. Is this the beginning of the last of the last days? Honestly, we don't know. We have talked many times about when the last days began. And they began with the... Uh, uh, Pentecost with the ascension of Jesus. That's when the last days actually began, according to Scripture. But if this is the last of the last days, the answer is we don't know. Because there have been conflicts and wars between these nations and people groups that in our lifetimes began in 1948 of differing length and severity. I thought it was interesting that the Prime Minister, Prime Minister of uh, Israel said, this is our 9-11. And he, he got the right idea there. You know, we were talking on the way up here, you know, and I heard this from one of the pundits. You know, people were saying, how is it that they could have missed and not known that this was going to That's not what we need to be asking right now. You know, when 9-11 came, we didn't know it was about to happen. To go further back, we didn't. it was a complete surprise that Japan bombed Pearl Harbor. And you know what we did both times? Okay, who did it? We're coming after you. Brothers and sisters, that's what Israel is going to do. And that's what they should do. And as Americans, we should support Israel, not just with words, but with materials that they may need. And to support them because they're God's people. I don't know about y'all. I don't want to be opposite of God. And I'm afraid that those who are attacking Israel are. This is the first time since 1973 that the leadership of Israel has said that we are in a war. So our mindset comes from Jesus, Matthew 24, beginning in verse 36. Again, remember, the question we're seeking to answer is, are these the last, last days? Jesus says in Matthew 24, 36, but concerning that day, that day, that day, and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, and it's in his humanity, but the Father only. Verse 40, I would believe, I would suggest this refers something of raptural uh, point. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and one left. Therefore, 
stay awake. Other translations say, be ready. For you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. And by the way, the way he, what he means by being ready is our walk and living to honor and glorify him. Uh, worshiping together, all of those things. But know this, verse 43, that if the master of the house had known, and this, this just came to me this morning, what part of the night? In other words, the darkness that Jesus talked about in other places, you know, he's equating it. When, when did people mostly get broken into? At night. Why? Because darkness covers them. If the master of the house had known what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Verse 44, underline this. Therefore, you also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. In fact, there's one place that would be very interesting. It says that Jesus will come when everybody's saying there's peace. There's peace. We've got peace everywhere. I mean, it's almost as though I'm more, I try to be more awake and thoughtful if everybody started getting along. Because that would be when it really falls out. We'll have to get to that another time. So we are to be ready. I would even suggest sometimes in the morning getting up, looking to the eastern skies, the sun rises and say, Jesus, come quickly. Because I think he's going to come from the east. That's from other scriptures. But uh, I want to conclude with one last passage. You go back to the Old Testament in the book of Isaiah. Now that's a big one, so you ought to be able to find it fairly easily. And remember I told you that we were going to start and end at the same place. We started with Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your pathway straight. And if you, and y'all are intelligent, smart people, what you have noticed is that really I never stopped from that point talking about how we need to be focusing on God, who he is, and how he acts and conducts according to his plan. But I want to end up in Isaiah 46 with a definitive passage, at least in my mind at this time, that I've had for a long time about how about who our God is Isaiah 46 beginning in verse 9 God is speaking it is written remember the former things of old for I am God and there is no other in other words Allah is a demonic idea Islam is demonic. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning. I love that. God's already, you think God is not in control right now? No, of course he is. This has been part of his plan since before creation. There is nothing happening that God has not Will and is part of his providence. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. Calling a bird of prey from the east, the man of my counsel from a far country. And I love this last part. I have spoken and I will bring it to pass. I have purposed, and I will do it. Guess what, brothers and sisters? I don't want this to sound... We're on the right side. I don't know what's going to happen to us physically, but that doesn't matter in the big scheme, big eternal scheme. What matters is our soul and our spirit with Almighty God through Jesus Christ. So that's where we end up, is who our God is, what he is doing, how he is going to do it, and how he will complete it. So, 
Let's go back to Proverbs 3, 5. Be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. There are so many times in the New Testament, Jesus said, don't worry. Where is it in Matthew? Uh, go to Matthew 6. Since y'all aren't in Matthew, are you? Well, I was. Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 25, Jesus is speaking. This is a part, a uh, section from the uh, Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about what? Your life. He says, don't be anxious about your life. You're breathing, you're seeing, you're hearing, you're thinking. Do not be anxious about your life what you will eat or what you will drink nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Boy, if you don't have that one underlined, uh, shame on you. And mine's not underlined, by the way. <laughs> and which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his lifespan? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? O oh, you of little faith. Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will take care of itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. My prayer and my hope in this message is that we will remember that God sits on his throne and that we have access to God through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit is with us. I don't know what's going to happen in the world tomorrow, much less this afternoon. But you know what? I don't have to worry about it. God's got it in his hand, and not only does he have it in his hand, he has us in his hand. What was that song we were taught in vacation Bible school? He's got the whole world in his hands. Yeah, that includes us. So, as you listen to Fox or whoever or read whatever, discuss whatever, in the back of your mind and deep in your heart, I want you to have these things in place so that you will not be afraid and you will not have fear and you will not worry. Let's pray. Father God, we praise, we honor, we glorify and worship you as the King of kings and the God of gods and all creation and that you and you alone are worthy of worship and praise and adoration. And so God, while we may be anxious at times, thank you that you have reminded us who you are, your power, your strength, and that we are your people and we can trust you for eternity. And so this world is really just uh, getting us closer to seeing you. God, guide the army of Israel Help them to protect your land, your holy land. And God, through them, also glorify your name that one day they too may be grafted back in to the olive tree to glorify and honor you and your son as Messiah. We love you, Father, because you first loved us. In Christ's name, amen. Joel.